we're going to talk about how to have a good future with kidney disease. And this slide says part one. We're not doing any other parts today, but there are actually six decks of slides that all go together. So I'm just using this deck that we have. Okay, and a few more folks to get settled. All right, we're gonna start in one more minute. So if you have, you're almost there, you're so close. And I appreciate people sitting near the front so that we're all together. All right, now it's 1.15, so we're gonna get started and anybody else who comes in, it's gonna be a little bit late and hopefully they won't miss too much. So I'm calling this coming to terms because one of the harder things to do, I think, and, and often when you first find out that your kidneys are not working so well, is to sort of get a grip on the emotions and get past the, the fear and the depression and to, to realize that there's hope, that you can have a good life with this. And I know, you know that I've been in contact with, or maybe you don't know that I'm in contact with thousands of patients every day, but I know so many people who do well with this, and then I know a lot of people who don't do so well, and sometimes the difference really is the attitude and how you look at your life, and so that's something we can help with. So we'll get started. So the tree bends, but it doesn't break, and I think you can see where I'm going with this. This tree is up on a slope, and it's beaten down by the winds, and it's just, it's adapted, right? It's, it, it didn't just fall over, it's not laying there, it's a good strong tree, but it's a kind of an interesting windswept shape. And that's kind of what we do too, right? We, we sort of bloom where we're planted, but we might get sort of blown over a little bit. We can still thrive. This tree is thriving. You can thrive. Now we talked about this before a little bit, that kidney disease can seem like a tidal wave in your life. And that is totally normal to feel like everything that you know has been washed away. Especially now, how many folks here, um, are their kidneys still work, but you're looking down the road at maybe they won't work so well in the future? Anybody? I know there's at least one. And, and how many of you are on dialysis of some kind now? Okay, and is it pr pretty new to you still? No, okay, all right. Well, anyway, it can seem like kidney disease, and, and in some cases the treatment for kidney disease can just wash away what you're used to. You know, like you had a job that you loved and now you feel like you can't do it anymore. Or you love to travel, but you're afraid to move away from your clinic because you know those people and you don't want to let anybody else touch your fistula or, you know, various other things. But that doesn't have to be the case. So the emotions, again, very normal. You know, I'm really afraid what's gonna happen to me. Is anybody feeling afraid right now? You don't have to raise your hand, but you know if you're feeling afraid. Totally, totally normal. In fact, I kind of worry a little bit about people who don't have these strong emotions because, I mean, this is a big deal. And if you don't have them and kind of work through them, they're probably gonna pop up some other time, bubble up and, and be a problem for you. So it's kind of better to feel them and move on through them than to, to say, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Tell everybody you're fine. You know, but you're not fine. You might need some support, you know, and hopefully you are fine. But. So depression, very common. It is treatable. If you are depressed, there are a number of different ways that it can be treated. And depression is two weeks or more of feeling down, blue, not enjoying things that you usually do. You may have no appetite for food. You may not sleep or you might sleep all the time. Um, you might not eat or you might eat everything. You know, a depression can look a lot of different ways, but fundamentally it's, you know, sort of sadness, feeling blue, and just, just this sort of whatever, what difference does it make? Nothing I do matters, I'm just gonna die anyway. You know what, we are all gonna die. There is not one of us who is gonna get out of this life alive, right? So, you know, that's kind of a given. And what you wanna do is obviously make the most of the time you have. And do you know how long it is? No, none of us know how long it is. That's up to God, right? It's not up to us. It's not even up to the doctor. So, you know, it's normal to be depressed, but there's also treatment. And there's, like I said, lots of different treatments. Um, antidepressants, obviously, are sort of an obvious one that 
your doctor might talk to you about and would, would need to prescribe, but there are other treatments for depression. Exercise can actually help depression a lot. Getting active, getting out in nature, spending time in nature. Go literally hug a tree. Or if you can't for mobility reasons or whatever, you can't get out to nature, then bring nature into you. Have a plant or a pet. Who has a pet? Yeah, pets can make a huge difference because they love us unconditionally. And if you have a pet, then you know there's somebody who cares that you get home every day. There's somebody you have to take care of. It gets you out of you and, and focuses you on somebody else. And one study actually found that it was more helpful to have a pet than to have other people in your life, <laughs> which is not to say you don't want to have people in your life. But, you know, it, a pet can really be a very, very good thing. And I have actually heard of doctors who will prescribe pets to people who are, you know, depressed. And I think that's a great idea. And it doesn't have to be a cat or a dog. I mean, you can get an iguana or whatever. Just make sure you wash your hands. They carry salmonella. Anyway, anger, also very, very normal. And some of the angriest people I know are people whose doctor missed the diagnosis. If you've been going to your family doctor for 20 years and now all of a sudden you found out that you are eight years into kidney failure, there are some very, very unhappy people. And that anger is something, again, that you need to acknowledge and you need to figure out a way to work through it and to kind of let it go. But you can have a future with kidney disease. Both of these folks, long, long, long term kidney patients. So Robin, you can see how great she looks after 31 years and she was setting out for a walk. Bruce did pass away a couple of years ago, but he was on dialysis for, I think, 41 years before he did. Um, Terry Oberly, first person I ever met on dialysis, he was a, a doctor, he was in medical school when he found out that his kidneys were failing due to Alport syndrome. He, he was on dialysis for 43 years. He had two children, he kept working, you know. He, so it is absolutely possible to do well, but doing well means that you need to do some things. So keeping a positive attitude is really, really important. And this is not coming from me, this is coming from folks who lived a really long time after kidney failure, and they will tell you that these are the most important things. Stay positive, look at the bright side, you know, see the silver lining, all of those sort of cliches, but they really do work. And get answers, so ask questions, it's okay to ask questions, it's good to ask questions. I still remember there was a focus group we did where it was um, people whose kidneys had failed and one of the questions we asked them was, how do you get information? Do you go to the library? Do you ask your doctor? You know, where do you look for information? And he looked right at the focus group facilitator and he said, I didn't know I was supposed to look for information about my kidney disease. If I would have known I was supposed to look for information, I would have looked for information. So I'm telling you all, this is part of your job. Part of your job as somebody with any chronic disease at all is to look for answers, look for information, and don't stop until you find it. It's, it's, it's life and death, it really is. And then take action. And that means take an active role. Know what's going on with you. Know how you feel. Know what your symptoms are. Tell your care team. Take action. So these are the three things that other people who've lived a long time with kidney disease have told us over and over and over are the really three keys to having a good future without kidneys that work well. And as I say, it, nobody accidentally lives for 30 or 40 years with, after kidney failure. It does actually take some effort, you know? So the three P's of pessimism, we want to try to not go there. You know, we don't want to blame ourselves. Oh, it's all my fault. If only I'd done this, that, and the other. Um, permanent. You don't want to be saying things will never get better. Never say never, basically. You don't know. I mean, the sun could be around a corner. Good things can happen. And then pervasive, which would be, oh, well, there's nothing in my life that's good, and this is just one more bad thing. That's, that's not where we want to be. We want to try to not go there. Because attitude really is important. And this is my reframing frame. So when we reframe things, we look at them in a different way. And we're going to do a couple exercises on that. This is a quote from somebody who lived through the Holocaust. He happened to be a psychiatrist, and he actually was practicing psychiatry in the concentration camp, believe it or not. And he was helping keep, keeping his uh, fellow inmates or whatever it is that we would call them, helping to keep them alive. And he said, basically, the last of the human freedoms 
is to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. So what does that mean? Anybody want to tell me? Exactly, you choose to be happy. That's exactly right, exactly right. You can't necessarily choose the things that happen to you in your life. Right? You don't choose to lose a job. You don't choose to have somebody that you, you know, your best friend move away. You don't choose to have somebody that you care about die. But you still have to deal with it. And you, you do have a choice always of how you deal with it. So that is very wise. So you can look at a lot of things in more than one way. And this is a very classic optical illusion. And it's two faces and a vase. And does everybody see both? Right, but you see both at the same time, right? So you can have the same circumstances and you can look at it in two different ways. So there's not always just one way. In fact, there's probably never just one way to look at anything. So I do know people who looked at kidney diseases, oh my God, this is so bad, this is so terrible, this is the worst thing that ever happened to me in my life. But you know what, I know a lot of other people who looked at it as, Wow, I'm really lucky. You know, there are other diseases that there aren't any treatments for, and this can be treated and I can live. So this is another one. Which orange circle? I like that the circle is orange. It's kind of appropriate for today because there's an awful lot of orange going on. I didn't realize I was going to clash so badly with all the orange of my red. But um, which orange circle is, about, is bigger? The one in the big circle or the one in the little circle? They are both the same size. Exactly. But what this tells you is that context matters, right? Because depending on how we have those other circles, we can make that circle look bigger or we can make it look smaller, but it is the same either way. And that's kind of the same thing with our troubles. You know, we can either make those bigger or we can make them sm smaller. It's up to us. The troubles are the same. So this is something to think about. And this is another episode of reframing. You know, is this little girl stubborn or is she persistent? It's just another, now I can tell you, I have two very persistent daughters. <laughs> I have no idea where they came by their persistence. No clue. Couldn't possibly be me, right? But, um, but you, can, you can see how if you call her stubborn, that that might be a negative thing and you might look at it as, you know, well, what a little brat or, you know, what a, what a naughty little girl. Whereas if you see it as persistence, which is a positive thing, it changes how you look at it. You think, wow, okay, this might be tough to deal with for the moment, but look at how this is gonna serve her for the rest of her life. It's a good thing to be persistent. Here, she's not gonna give up. She's not gonna let anything get in her way. She's gonna make it past all kinds of barriers, right? So we choose how we look at this. Now, this is Nick Vujicic. And Nick Vujicic was born with no arms and no legs in Australia. And you can imagine how difficult it was for a kid to be born with no arms and no legs. He had a really difficult childhood. He, I think he wanted to commit suicide at one point, but I gotta tell you that with no arms and legs, that's really challenging to do and he wasn't able to pull it off. And then at some point, he said, you know what? God made me like this, and I am like this for a reason. And I believe that the reason is to inspire other people and to give them hope. Because look at him, he's out golfing. He has a nonprofit organization now. He's an inspirational speaker. He speaks all over the world about what it's like and how he's made it by. And the thing is, there's always somebody who is worse off than us. No matter where we are, there is somebody who is worse off. And, you know, and that's kind of what he's saying. So I think it's important to think about Nick and to think about things could be worse. Who, who, didn't see, who saw the, the ice bucket challenge in the last few weeks, right? It was all over the place. And that's for ALS, amyotropic lateral sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease. There is no treatment for that disease. You know, you are in a wheelchair and you kind of go downhill and, until you can't breathe anymore. There's nothing that anybody can do. And hopefully all that money that they raised is going to help those folks and do some research and find a cure. But there's no cure. There's no cure for kidney failure either, but there are treatments. And there are treatments where you can live a good life for decades, you know? So things could be a lot worse. Kidney failure is not the worst thing that can be dealt out. So it's good to focus on looking forward, things that you can do, ways that you can look at it. 
kidney dialysis, chronic dialysis in this country started just about exactly the time I was born. I was born in 1960, and that's when dialysis started in the US. And you know what happened in the early 1960s? There wasn't enough of it to go around. There weren't enough machines. There weren't enough dialyzers. Not everybody who wanted dialysis could get it. And nobody with diabetes got it until the 1980s. So this is something where really, in a lot of very important ways, you are lucky. Because there are other diseases that we can't treat. And we can treat this one. And not only can we treat it, but the government pays for most of it. So it could be a lot worse. So we don't want to look backwards. Looking backwards rarely gets us anywhere. We have the life we have going forward. If, you know, God forbid we go home and we get hit by a car, and, you know, our life is different going forward than it was. There's really just no point in looking back. I know it's really tempting to do. Uh, if only I'd wish, I wish I'd appreciated what I had. Yeah, but you know what? We all go forward. None of us gets to go backwards. And generally, if we have all gotten to be the age that we are now, we have all coped with something difficult that has happened in our lives. So we have skills that we used for that. And we can apply those to this as well. So we have a skill set. We, maybe we have people in our lives that we can count on. Maybe we know how to find people if we don't ha know anybody who knows about the problem that we have now. Maybe we can find the National Kidney Foundation of Maryland and we can meet other people in the same boat and we can learn more. There's all sorts of different ways. Support is really important. So finding it in your life, finding it from your clergy person, finding it in your church, finding it in your neighborhood, in your family, um, in your dialysis clinic, if you're in, on dialysis now, that support is, it's a really important because we are social creatures and we need to have support. So finding other people in the same boat is a good thing. So your job as somebody with any chronic disease, and maybe you have more than one. A lot of people have more than one. Ask good questions. So what's a good question? You want to write down your questions? And you want to bring them in, make a notebook, bring them into your doctor. Who does that now? Do you, do you write down questions? Excellent, because that's such a better way to use the doctor's time, you know, to make sure that your number one question is number one on your list, because they don't have much time, you know, and it'll all go better. And um, know your own normal. Keep track. Keep track of your lab tests. Keep track of how you feel. If you're having symptoms, keep track of what those are. Keep track of what makes them better and what makes them worse. Bring that in. Talk to your doctor. You know, because if your doctor sees that you're doing some of the work, you're starting that conversation in a completely different spot. So rather than your doctor feeling like he has to start at zero and explain everything, you can say, you know, you can start out by saying, you know, I've noticed that my blood pressure is higher at night than it is in the morning. What might cause that? And he's going to realize that you know more, and he's going to start talking to you like you know more. Um, it's really important to be specific about why you're there and to be brief. I talk to a lot of folks on the phone every week, and I can tell you that the ones who are likely to be much more successful with their doctor are the ones who can kind of cut to the chase and say, I've got this symptom. It started on this day. I didn't have it before, but I just started that med. Do you think maybe that's related? Or I don't know what it is, but what you don't want to do is go back to, well, when I was five, I twisted my ankle, and, then, and, and people do that. I can't tell you how many people on the phone want to give me their entire life story. I don't have time to listen to the whole thing, and neither does the doctor. So we want to be pretty fixed and pretty specific in what we ask and put the first most important thing first. And don't not tell the doctor anything, OK? If you're using drugs that you know are not legal, whatever, they need to know. Taking supplements, because if they don't have the whole picture, they can't tell, you know. Support person, who brings one with them to the doctor? It's a good idea. Especially if you're going to get news that might be scary or difficult for you, you want to have somebody else there to listen also, if you can. Because as soon as a doctor says something scary, the ears close shut, and you don't hear another word they say. And that's just, that's how life works. We are all like that. It has nothing to do with kidney disease and everything to do with fear. So um, you want to stay calm. You want to stay respectful. If you, you know, even if you are really angry, it's OK to say, wow, I'm really angry about this, but not OK to yell and swear. You know, I'm reasonably certain that the folks who show up on a Sunday, again, you guys are the best and not the ones who would do that, but I'm sure you've heard of folks who do. It is absolutely okay if the doctor talks in jargon to say, I didn't understand that, would you mind repeating it in English? 
it's perfectly okay to do that. Doctors learn in medical school how to turn, talk medicalese. They don't necessarily learn how to translate it back into English. But if you don't understand it, don't sit there and not understand it. It is absolutely okay to say, okay, wait, meta what? I don't know what you're, I, I didn't get that. Can you just say that in English? That's fine. You didn't go to medical school. I didn't go to medical school. You know, we don't necessarily know these things. I would ask my doctor. And then write things down. Just like you wrote down your questions to go in, you can also write down notes and say, okay, wait, did I get this right? You said that, you know, that this is happening. All right, kidney school, we talked about that a little bit, and there are modules, and 16 modules, and all kinds of stuff. And I'm gonna cut to the end, and then we can have questions, and we will have like 10 minutes, so that's good. So, you cannot choose what happens to you, but you can always choose how you look at it. You can have a good future if you stay positive and learn all you can and take an active role in your care. And you are the only one who can become your own expert. That's kind of the goal. I, I'm seeing some nodding heads up here of ladies that I suspect are experts and are learning hopefully maybe even more here. But, but that's kind of the goal. The goal is you are the one who knows you the best and you can be an expert. And here, I'm gonna leave this up on the screen. This is a list of lots of places to know more. And then, like I said, we have 10 minutes for questions. Any questions?